Hello and welcome to my channel, I'm Fornax and this is another of my rambling law videos. Today's story, the sad tale of Scarlet Briar aka Ciara, the second born. The whys, the wherefores, the whats, that's what we're going to look at today. So if you were late to the game, to the party of Guild Wars 2, Scarlet's rambunctious rampage through Tyria was um, the bulk of the season one storyline and a very ambitious narrative it was to boot. It's also sadly not repeatable. Back at launch the game was a very different animal and there are arguments for and against the changes that the devs made in the game going forward. The ethos was that there was time-limited, finite content that was non-repeatable for season one, and it had, I'm going to say, mixed reviews from the player base. I can see the pros to this. There are lots of bragging rights. Speaking purely as a content creator, I'm fairly for replayable content. It helps me make better videos about it. It helps me to set up shots, be able to play through things multiple times, to give you guys lovely images on the screen, to really cement in my brain what's actually happened so that I can analyze it rather than the seat of your pants playthroughs, which are a little bit scary to make content around those. And I guess the lack of replayability is a good reason to have a law video like this, which details some of the niff-naff minutia and trivia in a more palatable way than just sitting and reading about it all on the wiki. Let's get back to the naughty Silvari in question. Was she mad, sad, or simply bad? Let's have a look at the early life of Ciara. Born in 1304, Ciara was a member of the Second Awakening. There are other notable Silvari of this generation. Kanak, most likely is the best known one our player companion, our hero companion in the story, one of my favourite characters of the story. But there is also the leader of the Nightmare Court, Caden, was one of the secondborn too. It's not all rogues though, rogues and villains and um, chances like good old Kanek. Larenthia of the Wild was also a secondborn. So it's a mixed bag. <laughs> we all have our black sheep. So, she was born around seven-ish years after the first generation of Solvari appeared. Some of this group felt second-class citizens because of this long lead lag to the next generation and felt almost cursed forever to live in the shadow of their first-born brethren. Now, this was very much a motivating factor behind Caden's fall into the nightmare. But Ciara was a very different person, and her motives were driven not from an abundance of emotion, of self-doubt and embitteredness, but from an absence, a lack of empathy and compassion and connection, which is surprising for one who was portrayed as so gifted of the mind. Now, writers like to make profoundly bright people more humanized, I guess, by emotionally stunting them. But in reality, the vast majority of intelligent people, deeply gifted people, are also profoundly compassionate and moral beings because of that intelligence. Because they think deeply about the ramifications of their actions, about the people around them. So, Ciara really does follow the kind of house brand of brilliance whereby the person is remote and superior and profoundly selfish, utterly selfish. The wiki goes so far as to say that Ciara has a personality disorder, one of the dark triad of personality disorders. And if you think that that sounds quite ominous, <laughs> Well, you are, you are quite correct. This is a very exclusive club that really nobody wants to be a member of. So this is the domain of the psychopath, the sociopath, the narcissist, 
Now, that's not to say that these kinds of minds are all villainous in the criminal sense or the classic sense. The the majority of people who live with this kind of brain structure live very normal, very productive lives. But in relationship terms, like the ocean, it's best not to turn your back on them. Now, despite her inability to connect with others, despite her lack of compassion, she has a profound connection with learning and is endlessly fascinated with the world around her. There is a burning, unquenchable thirst for knowledge. This is her primary driver. And in terms of genius, she is on the level of a da Vinci, a Hawkin. She is a Penrose. She is a a mind of her generation. And in just eight years, she has devoured all of the knowledge, the scientific knowledge, the cultural knowledge of her people. And in the absence of any feeling of familial connection, and any bonds that tie us to our family, And acting against the guidance of the dream, of the pale tree, of of the menders who help Silvari from awakening to adulthood, Sierra dismisses their guidance and heads out into the world. She is an independent individual. She knows what she wants, she knows what she doesn't want, and she will be damned if she's going to be told what to do with her life. And if it sounds a bit like a rebellious teen, perhaps there is an element of that. She she has a childlike quality to her in her intonation, in her capricious, erratic behavior. Nevertheless, she heads out into the world seeking knowledge, seeking understanding. Now, Sierra would study under three great masters. The Norn Smith Beathgar, Azagi, the Char demolitionist and sniper, and Omad, the head of the College of Synergistics. Under each expert, she excels, exceeding all their expectations, even the arrogant Omad. Yet, for all her brilliance, all her achievements, she would ultimately let down or leave all of her mentors. The Norn Smith Beathgar, he had taken Ciara under his wing almost as a daughter and hoped that one day she would succeed him, become the great smith of Holbrecht and carry on the traditions of his work. But, of course, she would not. Asagi, we're not entirely sure of the relationship that they have, but when Ciara leaves, Asagi goes on her last patrol, which in char terms is today is a good day to die. It's kind of like the Norn retirement plan, where you go to war and you don't come home again. So, dead men tell no tales unless you have a good necromancer and nobody has poked Asagi, so we don't know that story. And as for Omad, Omad was forced to expel Ciara from Ratasun when she was caught breaking into the Arcane Council's chamber with her inquest cohorts. Now, I think this would have been particularly distressing, annoying for Omad because he had been the driving force behind allowing Ciara to become a part of the academic community of Ratasun. He had pushed for her acceptance into all the colleges, and she had graduated from each Asuran College of Learning, at the top of her class. And you can imagine the arrogant little Asura's utter astonishment and disbelief that an inferior being managed to best them at their own game. Now, one course of study, one area of study, gripped and captured Ciara's attention and would become her lifelong obsession, the study of the eternal alchemy. It almost became an all-consuming passion, and I think it perhaps is the closest thing to love, or at least obsessive love, that she would have felt with her disability. 
Now, it's also notable that she forged a lifelong relationship with the inquest. And it's said that she found the inquest and their methodology and their ideology the closest to a line to her own. Which kind of speaks volumes about the grey, dark grey nature of Ciara even before things go extremely bad for her. Extremely bad. It's so telling of her mindset and her, her lack of moral center that even before her brush with divinity, um, the mental dysphoria was already incredibly front and center with this character. Thus far, though, in her life, Ciara's drive had been the pursuit of knowledge, and more specifically, the understanding of how the world functioned. If she were a modern-day scientist, you could imagine her in the realm of quantum physics. She would be, you know, hunting the unified theory, bridging the gap between the seemingly non-causal quantum realm and the macro universe that we exist in. So she is cutting edge, she is brilliant, and in her time at Ratasun, she did incredible things, creating the steam creatures which to this day still inhabit slash slightly plague the Shiver Peak Mountains. Now to be clear, these beings that she created all on her lonesome are sentient life forms capable of self-maintenance, of self-awareness, of procreation in a fashion. They salvage to make copies of themselves, replicator style if you're a Stargate fan. An extraordinarily staggering feat. Creating a sentient life form is quite an astonishing thing. It's almost a side note in her resume of extraordinary and terrible things that she's done. Now, she also, during this period, discovered, or perhaps it's better to say rediscovered, for the new modern world, the existence of ley lines. Now, ley lines were known by the Asura of Ratanova. And let's be clear, finding the ley lines is the inciting incident which leads her down a path which ends very badly for everybody. After her expulsion from Ratazun's academic community. It didn't defeat her. She still sought knowledge wherever she was. Even in her isolation, even in the middle of the Maguma jungle, she sought knowledge. She found a tribe of friendly Hylix and she studied their alchemical tribal science, which I think speaks a lot to her character. She may not have been ethical, but she had an extraordinary work ethic. Now, by the time Omad found her in the Maguma jungle, she had already mastered all that the Makoto had to offer. And the reason that he had sought her out was because he needed a disposable test subject, which speaks to Omad's morality. Now, Ciara, ever hunting for a deeper understanding of the reality of the world, could not pass up the opportunity to see the furnace of creation, the all, the eternal alchemy. And this is the, the cherry, the, the cake that Omad dangled in front of his young, impressionable student. Now, keep in mind that Omad had already fed a number of student slash test subject into his machine, the isolation module. And fed is quite a literal term in this sense because no one who entered the machine left it alive. So very much a bad scientist. <laughs> good science is ethical science. Omad, not a good scientist. So this is where Sierra's already morally grey life, morally dark grey life, darkened considerably. Inside Omad's machine, Ciara came face to face 
with the mother she had rejected so many years before. Now, the pale tree tried to intercede, tried in vain to, to stop her wayward daughter, her wayward child, from taking a step into a place she could not retreat from. The realm that Ciara was heading into would forever change her. And the pale tree knew this. The pale tree knew that if her daughter was exposed, that it would cost her everything. And the knowledge that she would gain from this experience would pale into insignificance compared to what she would lose in herself. But even in this dire situation, with her daughter facing the worst possible outcome to lose oneself, Pale Tree did not reveal the true nature of the Solvari heritage to her daughter. And it's interesting to note that Ciara would become the second daughter that the Pale Tree would see sacrifice to keep the secret. Also bear in mind that the Pale Tree also kept silent as hundreds, perhaps even thousands of Salvare heading into jungle dragon territory, she knew the risk. She knew the vulnerability and yet she warned no one. At this point, before the pact, before the fall, she would have weighed the odds of Ciara's life, of Wynne's life against the weight of her entire people's existence going forward. Once that particular genie is out of the bottle, you can't stuff it back in. Once the other races knew their nature, it is entirely possible especially from a narrative point of view, it would be a very interesting story whereby the other nations turn on the Solvari. What would have happened then? Back to Omad and his machine and Ziara. So the machine exposed Ziara to the corrupted, the corrupted forge of creation, corrupted by the dragon's influence over the magic cycles. And in turn, the mind of what is essentially a god, the elder dragon Mordremoth, no longer under the protection of the pale tree, stripped of it, laid bare, naked before this horrific power. Even in his sleeping form, this god creature was capable of twisting the mind of even this capable, bloody-minded individual. As a Silvari, the dream of dream is your protection, your haven, your ward, your shield against the corrupting influence of Mordremoth. But it is not impenetrable, and it can be rejected. Once you reject it, it's a one-way process. Like the Soundless, who are a, a sect in Zalvari culture who have rejected the Dream of Dreams, and like the Nightmare Court, who have rejected the dream of dreams. They are profoundly vulnerable. And even dreamers are capable of being corrupted by the dragon. All that is required is proximity. And Ciara was literally walking, mindscaping into the dragon's den. Through her vision, through her interaction, she discovered the true nature of her people. And she came mind to mind with a monster. A real monster, not just a girl who lacked compassion and had interesting mind architecture. She came face to face with a, with a primordial being and it broke who she was, it shattered her. Ciara went into the isolation module, but Scarlet Briar came out. And her first act was to murder Omad. It's hard to feel anything when a monstrous being is ended. It's hard to muster any empathy. But I think we need to remember here that for all Ciara's detachment, compassionlessness, she had never taken a life. She had been ruthless. She had been single-minded. She had been entirely selfish. But she had never 
crossed the Rubicon. She had never done something so terrible as it can never be taken back. Now everything, everything had changed. And little by little, the dragon infected her brilliant mind. Her dreams became haunted to the point that she couldn't, wouldn't sleep. The dragon pushing and pressing her towards his goal, twisting her thoughts, twisting her mind, blurring the line. His intention was to make her the single spark that would set the world ablaze. And so desperate was she to free herself from this menace in her mind that Scarlet actually turned to her Silvari brothers and sisters, to the menders of the grove, to the caretakers, to the healers of the Silvari nation. But there was nothing, there was nothing they could do. They could not help her. The protection had gone and no one could save her. Mordermoth chipped away, pushed, cajoled, blurred the lines of reality. What was her plan? What was his plan? What was her desire? What was his desire? And through all this manipulation, all this play, she would eventually become his willing, unwilling agent. She would forge three alliances. The Molten Alliance, which was the Burning Legion and the Dredge. The Aether Blades, which were sky pirates, so um, pirates who stole packed ships to raid everybody. <laughs> pirates, it's kind of in the name. And the Inquest. So the Aether Blades were the Inquest and these Sky Pirates. And then the Toxic Alliance was the Nightmare Court and the Crate. And each of these alliances were, were all working in unison, all to destabilize the Shiver Peaks, Ascalon, Kryta, and Maguma. Now she would build a Tower of Nightmare in the Keswick Hills, she would forge great machines capable of, of disrupting, de redirecting the ley line energy of Tyria using their technology. She used the Aether Blades as, as a kind of death from above, an invading army, terrorizing towns, terrorizing villages, attacking Lion's Arch, attacking Divinity's Reach. As the attacks ramped up, she attempted kidnap possible regicide against Queen Jenna at Queen Jenna's Jubilee. She corrupted the Queen's Clockwork Knight Army. She arranged the murder a Captain's Council member, Lion's Arch, the ruling pirates as it were. She arranged the murder of one of their number at the Dragon's Bash and then tried to insert Matrin, her proxy, onto that council. She rained down terror and destruction for months across vast swathes of Tyria. And no group of people suffered more than the, the peoples of Lion's Arch. The destruction of that beautiful city, honestly heartbreaking to play through. The new incarnation of the city is not well loved by veteran players because simply how wonderful the city was before they decided to blow it up. It was incredibly old it felt lived in it it was interesting it had character it was a genuinely beautiful soulful city and it felt inhabited it felt like it, it had evolved organically it was a thing of beauty and over a period of time just completely destroyed it it was wonderful storytelling and it was also heartbreaking to watch at the time the story culminates with scarlet invading proper the city of Lion's Arch, destroying it, decimating it, crashing her mechanized breach maker into the harbor, into the ley lines underneath Lion's Arch, and her plan succeeding. Guess I missed the, the whole her trying to capture Kaith and dangling her terrible little secret in front of her to try and capture her in the Aetherblade dungeon in Twilight Arbor. There's that. You can still play through that portion of, of the story. But at every turn during her invasion, we, the player character, interceded. We valiantly fought for the people of Tyria. And at the time when I was playing through it, she seemed a fairly one-dimensional villain, a fairly hyperbolic menace she was manic 
in her displays. She seemed entirely untethered from sanity and reality. We were witness to the full frontal of manic, maniacal, shrieking lunacy and murderous intent all rolled into a cute kind of package with a little girl voice. She is a jarring villain when you do not understand her motivations and I genuinely, at the time, I enjoyed the crazy scrum of the mad activities that were going on in the world. But of her, I was not, I was not too impressed with her at the time, which is sad. I, I think I missed a trick. I just found her too much. It genuinely is sad because now, having played through season two, where we find out about her and who she was, I, I think she is an interesting character. And of course, it was around her, around her character, facing the, the consequences of her assault on Tyria, on the Shiver Peaks, that Dragon's Watch, or what would become Dragon's Watch, took shape. Which is why it's almost criminal that this content is not replayable in the game. For example, we meet Bram for the first time as the Molten Alliance attacks his home. We meet Cass and Jury as they're investigating the, the murder, the usurping of power by Mei Tren. We meet Taimi in Lochnar's Pass as she is trying to understand the mechanism by which Scarlet has created the Twisted Marionettes, which were massive, gigantic, mechanized creatures that she terrorized and murdered people with. It was, it was crazy. Of course, we meet Rox as well at this time in a mission to try and reclaim a Legion hatchery that had been taken out by the Molten Alliance. So all of the hero characters who are a staple part of our existence even Ritlaw, he is a part of this storyline too, so all of the, the seminal, important people that are by our side, including Kanak, who was also introduced in this narrative, they are all in season one and yet we can't play it. Scarlet and her story are a vital part of the game that we play today of Guild Wars 2. The impact of her character and the legacy of it are lost on far too many. Season one is a footnote in our story journal, and it genuinely chaps my ass. We all know the story going forward. Scarlet is killed by our character, but of course, not before she wins. She wins. All the desperate threats, all the alliances, all the general insanity had led up to this moment, this ley line, and Modremoth awakens and we lose. We also should remember that Ciara lost along with us. For all her faults, Ciara was as much a victim of the war as anyone else. All she had ever wanted was freedom. Freedom to choose her path. Freedom to explore the world. Freedom to follow her passions. Freedom to do what she wanted to do. I do recommend playing through season two. There are some genuinely interesting insights into her mind, into her life before, which a lot of the stuff that I talk about relates to. And I would genuinely like to know what your thoughts are about Ciara and Scarlet. Do you think the devs should dedicate time to bringing the story back to the playbase? so that we have a fully fleshed out storyline for these very important hero characters? Or do you think that it should be left as it is, a kind of footnote in the history of the game? Let me know in the comments below. If you liked this video, please do give it a thumbs up, share, subscribe to the channel if you really like it, and please do show some love to Ada. Hain, Cub, Molani, Christopher Martin, Sir Azu, Jolly Joe Star, Dark Griever, and goodness, all my absolutely wonderful patrons, without whom I would not be able to dedicate the time and resources I do to my content creation. I can never thank them enough. And if you feel like you want to jump into Guild Wars 2 and experience the story, there are referral links below to the free-to-play game, the Heart of Thorns expansion, which is all about Mordremoth, and the Path of Fire expansion, which is the 
latest and greatest expansion that there is with lots of mounts and things. If you use the links, it helps the channel directly because I am a member of their partner program. I am an affiliate of their partner program. So I hope you will join me again for more lore rambly videos. There's some raid guides coming up on the channel soon as well. But until then, as always, thanks for watching.